Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in today's video tutorial we're going to be introducing the topic of dimensional analysis. Now in dimensional analysis what we're aiming to do is to reduce engineering quantities to their basic dimensions and there are actually four basic dimensions that we're interested in. The first is mass, the second is length, the third is time, and the fourth is temperature. But for the purpose of this tutorial, we're just going to focus on these three, mass, length, and time. Now when we talk about masses, it has a dimension of mass, and we use the capital letter M to represent that, and the same for length and time. We use a capital L to represent length, and a capital T to represent time. Now as I mentioned at the start there, all engineering quantities can be reduced to these three basic dimensions of mass, length and time. So let's look at some of the more straightforward ones first of all and we'll also introduce some of the notation that goes alongside this topic. Now the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the dimensions of area and because we're inspecting the dimensions we put that value into square brackets or that quantity into square brackets. Now hopefully you realize that area is basically a length times a length. So here in the square brackets we're inspecting the dimensions of a length times a length. So what we're actually doing here is we're doing a length times a length. Now hopefully you recall from the work you've previously done on indices is that L is basically the same thing as L to the 1 and again L is the same thing as L to the 1. Now when we multiply two indices together what we effectively do is add them. So L to the 1 times L to the 1 is L squared. Let's move on to another example and this time we're going to introduce two dimensions at once because what we're going to do is we're going to look at the dimensions of density. Now one of the important things that you'll need to be able to do is to think of each of these quantities in terms of what they actually represent. Now when we talk about the density of an object, we're basically talking about how much mass it has compared to its volume, or how tightly packed a material is. So density is mass per unit volume. So here, on our dimensions, we're doing the dimensions of mass divided by volume. Mass divided by volume is basically a simplified definition of density. So here, we can write m divided by volume. Well, volume is a length times a length times a length, or a length cubed. So we have mass divided by length cubed. Now there's a slight trick with this. Effectively what we're doing, on the top of this equation, we have L to the zero, or we don't have any Ls. And what we need to do is we need to bring the L from the bottom up to the top. Now when we do that, it becomes a negative ML to the minus 3, like so. Where this ties in with our law of indices is effectively what we've just done there is we've done L to the 0 divided by L cubed. And when you divide an indice, you subtract the indice from the denominator from the indice from the numerator. And by the denominator there, I just mean the number on the bottom. And by the numerator, I mean the number on the top. So we're doing 0 minus 3, which gives us our L to the minus 3. Okay, let's continue with another example where we're introducing two of these dimensions and what we're going to look at this time is velocity. Now, in terms of simplified definitions for velocity, when we talk about the velocity of something or the speed of something, we're talking about how far it travels in a given period of time. So the way that we can write that this time is length divided by time or length per unit time. In terms of our dimensions, that's L over T, or L to the 1 divided by T to the 1 if you prefer. And we're going to bring the T to the 1 up to the top, so it needs to become a minus. So our final dimensions for that are L T to the minus 1. Now what we can do is we can use dimensions that we already know in order to work out the dimensions of a new quantity. And I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, we wanted the dimensions of acceleration. Well, acceleration 
is rate of change of velocity. It's basically how much a velocity changes in a given time period. So what we can write this time is velocity divided by time. Now we know our dimensions of velocity because we've just found them at lt to the minus 1. And we know that our dimensions of time is t, or t to the 1. Now once again, this is where our law of indices come in, because we have L on its own, so we don't need to adjust that. We have t to the minus 1 divided by t to the 1. Well, minus 1 that we have here on the numerator, minus 1 that we have here on the denominator, gives us t to the minus 2. There is another way of thinking of this, as I mentioned before, and I'll just write this in the top right corner. We've got t to the minus 1 divided by t to the 1. Now what we can think of is bringing this t to the 1 up to the top. And what we end up with is t to the minus 1, t to the minus 1. Well in this case, because we're multiplying the indices, we need to add minus 1 and minus 1 together, which would actually give us t to the minus 2. Exactly the same thing as we found when we used our laws of indices. Okay, let's look at a couple more examples. This time, let's look at the dimensions of force. What we need to do here is we need to think of some equations that we know for force. And the one that always springs to mind is Newton's second law. Force is basically mass times acceleration. Uh, another way of thinking of force is as rate of change of momentum. There's all these different ways that we can think about force. But I'm going to use mass times acceleration. And once again, I already know the dimensions of mass. And I also know the dimensions of acceleration from my previous example. So on the bottom here, I can write mass as the dimensions of mass. We've already found the dimensions of acceleration as LT to the minus 2. Therefore, our dimensions of force are mlt to the minus 2, or m to the 1, l to the 1, t to the minus 2. OK, so now let's look at one or two more complicated examples, only slightly more complicated in that they're introducing more of these dimensions. And let's this time take our example of pressure. Now, once again, pressure can be expressed in a number of different ways. We could think of hydrostatic pressure, which is density times gravity times height. We could think of pressure as force divided by area. So there's a number of different representations of pressure that we can use to help us find the dimensions. And the one I'm going to use is force per unit area or force divided by area. So it's helpful if you can recall equations for some of these things. Well, we've just defined the dimensions of force as m l t to the minus 2. And we also know that area is length times length or length squared. So once again, we've got an m to the 1, l to the 1, t to the minus 2 on the top, and we've got an l to the 2 on the bottom. The law of indices states that we need to subtract the value of the indice in the denominator from the value of the indice in the numerator. So 1 minus 2 is minus 1 we get m, l to the minus 1, t to the minus 2 as our dimensions for pressure. OK, let's just look at one more example. And this introduces another new concept, because what we can do is if we want to find the dimensions of energy as an example, then we can use an equation that we know for energy. And an equation that we know for energy is that kinetic energy equals a half mv squared. Now here's the important thing, constants such as this half here don't have any dimensions and I'll come back to this principle in a second but if constants don't have any dimensions then hopefully you can see here that what I'm actually trying to find is the dimensions of mass times velocity squared. Well mass is straightforward enough, velocity we know is lt to the minus 1. But what this example requires us to do is square the velocity. 
Now I'm going to put my 1 back in here, L to the power 1, because what we're going to end up with is M, L to the 1 squared, and again this comes from our law of indices, if we raise the power, then what we need to do is multiply these two numbers together. So 1 times 2 is 2, so we get L squared. And we need to do the same with the time because they're both inside the brackets there. T to the minus 1 squared, well minus 1 times 2 is minus 2. So we end up with ML squared T to the minus 2. We could have approached that a different way. We could have used our formula for potential energy where potential energy is mass times gravity times height. And in actual fact, we would have arrived at the same answer. Now, just to return to this idea that constants don't have dimensions, and I want you to think of an area. Let's say this is the area of a postage stamp. So we've got a very small area here. Hopefully you can see that the dimensions of that is still going to be a length times a length. The dimensions are still going to be a length squared. What we're not taking into consideration is the size. All we're looking at is the dimensions. If we were to compare that to um, a second area, which has the same width, but is twice the length as an example, then once again, the dimensions are still a length times a length. There's no change there. So therefore we can disregard any constants. And just to kind of really reinforce this idea, if we had an area that was the size of a football pitch as an example, it would still be a length times a length. Its dimensions would still be L squared. So it doesn't actually make any difference what constants we attach to these things. We've got the example here, kinetic energy is a half mv squared. But anywhere where we have constants, we can just disregard those when we come to look at the dimensions.